Thanks. Good morning, and you're very welcome to the first of our 2015 Belvin uh, seminars called What Can Belvin Really Deliver? I'd like to also say a friendly hola. Uh, as I understand, we have a guest laureate from uh, Belvin, Spain. You're very, very welcome. And to the rest of you, you're very welcome. Some of you I know have been on the sessions before, and for others, it's your first time. You're all very, very welcome. Today, we're trying to focus on what Belvin can actually output. And to do that, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Kay Joyce of Moving Forward Learning, who has been a long-time devotee of Belvin and is now uh, helping us to promote Belvin in the Munster region. And uh, she'll be going through her experience with Belvin in about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about practically what it's delivered, what it delivers for clients, what it delivers as a coach, and obviously what it delivers with end individuals. Some of you will be interested in potentially using Belvin as a, as it, within your own company or as a potential business. But there's also a business opportunity in it for a coaching company or consultancy. And that's something that we'll be talking a lot about during the 2015 series of seminars and indeed hopefully meeting uh, people around the country in Ireland and talking to them about the opportunities of using Belbin within their business. But to do that, first of all, the system has to be seen really to deliver. So we're trying to put the emphasis firmly on what it does. As ever, however, I'm going to start the session by briefly running through Belbin and briefly running through what its systems is for those who are perhaps not as familiar as others. So fire away, Rory, there. Um, a short introduction, I'll quickly go through the team roles, we'll look at how to use the profiles, I'll then hand it over to the K and we'll take any questions. And there are two pictures of us, you can see the attractive person here, <laughs> and as a clue it's not me. Um, by the way, if anybody has mugshots else they want to come in, do let us know. Just to remind, as of September 2014, we are the legal and sole distributors for Belbin on the island of Ireland. What we offer is guidance on how to apply Belbin in a team situation, practitioner and accreditation training, um, the profiles reports and technical supports you need to help you to sell and promote the product, advice on plagiarisms and, up, and upgrade schemes for people currently using paper and other institutions using unofficial Belbin materials, and more importantly, helping you with team interventions and consulting to organizations that want to put the methodology into action. So we cover all parts of Ireland, north and south. Uh, we are politically uh, neutral in that regard. And look forward to speaking to everybody uh, in the course of the year. OK? Right, Rory? Meredith Belvin, who many of you will know was the original innovator of the Belvin system, produced some work when he was in Henley Business School in the early 80s, where he divided that essentially people's behavioral contribution was very, very key and sometimes more determinant of a correct outcome of a team than their training or experience or their attitude. And he defined a team role as a tendency to behave, contribute, and interrelate with others in a particular way. And in the course of the last 30 years, the Bowman organization has built up surrounding how behavior can be measured and what it tells us about how teams perform. Often the teams that are academically the best qualified or have the most experience don't tend to gel. And we find that a balanced team of people who have got a series of roles and know them can often, indeed, invariably do, outperform a team of alleged superstars. So that's where he goes. Thanks, Rory. It's a well-proven model for us to understand people. OK, the nine team rules, which I'll go through and I've talked through before, um, but for those who don't remember them, uh, we start with the plant. The plant is the ideas person creative, free thinking, able to generate ideas and solve problems. However, the weakness or allowable weakness of that can be that a plant can too often be preoccupied and ignore the incidentals. 
ignore the details, ignore how something can be done and where it can be done. And that can often mean it's difficult to communicate effectively. But for getting ideas going and for being creative generally and thinking outside the box, plant is a very important team role. The second team role is resource investigator. Uh, that's someone who generally looks externally for problems and solutions. They are going, they're enthusiastic, they explore opportunities and they develop contacts. However, as is the nature with people, sales and marketing people such as myself, by the way, very, very strong RI tendencies, they can be over-optimistic and if something doesn't happen, it can be difficult to keep them going. So a weakness is important that people understand sometimes uh, resource investigator people can have that tendency. You'll notice, by the way, that beside each team role is a little symbol. I'll go through those symbols, every one of them. The plant was a light bulb, and the resource investigator is a telephone, because um, they will likely use the phone and be outwardly mobile in how they discuss and contribute on certain issues. Team role three is a coordinator, and depicted on a sign by an orchestra conductor. Mature, confident, clarifies goals, brings them together. However, sometimes in a situation where that coordinator is doing so, they can offload their share of work and they can be seen as manipulative. Coordinators often see that work is done, but often delegate the jobs they do not wish to do to others. So there's always a shadow side and that's something you need to think about. A shaper is as defined by the whip. He or she would crack the whip, make sure things get done. They can be challenging, dynamic, they can drive and overcome all obstacles. They can also be difficult to work for, difficult to bring people on board, and can eventually be provocative and offend people. The shadow side of that is that they sometimes find it difficult to get people to work with them, except when they're being purely directive. On the other hand, when a team isn't sure of where it's going, a shaper or a leader with shaper tendencies can be extremely useful, hence the use of the whip. Number five is the monitor evaluator, which is seen by the all-knowing eye. The eye is the person who can look at things from a totally different angle. Uh, that's the kind of person in a conversation or discussion who can look at things from a completely different way. They can look at all the outcomes. They can look at the contingencies. They can often look at the things that a resource investigator or a plant cannot see as obstacles, but a monitor evaluator sees the obstacles and will be able to look at them and make a, their own view about how the obstacles can, can be got through. But what they can also do, which is extremely important, is point out for the over-enthusiastic and optimistic plant and RI how these things can be got through. The shadow side is, of course, that monitor evaluators can be seen to be uh, a, a little anal and a little, in, a little inspired to just look at the small things and not the big things. They can sometimes be seen not to think outside the box, but that's okay because what they're doing is simply putting something to a test. So as in all the Melbourne team roles, a good monitor evaluator is vital to help the plant and the RI to make something happen. Role six is the team worker role, which is defined by the hands coming together. It is a team. This is someone who smooths. It's a diplomat who tries to ensure not only that the team are together, but that the team's hearts as well as heads are in the idea. They want things to work. They want things to be smooth. They want things to gel, and they want everybody to be happy. The shadow side of that, however, can mean that they avoid confrontation, avoid the difficult decisions. And when something has to be taken, it can be very hard to do so. For fear of offending people's failings, they may make the wrong decision or no decision at all. And that can be very, very difficult for a team to live with. Strongly, the teamwork, however, has their place. And more often than not, they're the people trying to make sure that the team gets along as well as getting the right result. The seventh team role is the implementer, and that's where you see the cogs of the wheel. The cogs of the wheel, the oil, the lubricant that actually brings the wheel together. These are the people who get things done, and that's their basic function. If you want people to be reliable, to be efficient, to turn ideas into actions, they get things done. However, they are somewhat slow sometimes to respond to new possibilities. 
they need guidance. They're the type of people who need firm, clear parameters to work with and possible instructions. Therefore, it's sometimes rare to find them taking new ideas, being proactive, and being autonomous. On the flip side, if we don't have implementers, no project gets finished. So it's extremely important that an implementer role be seen in the team to some extent. Team Role 8 is a completer finisher. And the completer finisher is the person who finally puts the final nut and bolt in place on a particular project. So the nut and the bolt is being tightened in the, in the brown slide you see there. This is the person who is painstaking, who's conscientious, who looks at all the little details and finds out where the things are wrong that everybody else has seen. So they will look at it and they will make it right. To them, no job is too small not to be done perfectly. And if it's got to be delivered late, it'll be delivered late. But it won't be delivered wrong. It will be delivered right. And that leads to some creative tension. The tension between getting it done and getting it done correctly. For a completer finisher, there's probably never enough time to complete to the standards they're happy with. That can also mean that they worry and that they tend to take on too much for themselves because, of course, only they can deliver to the standards they expect. The ninth role, and a role which is actually added after the initial research, is the role of specialist. And it's important to state that specialist does not mean someone who is just an expert in their own area. It's the person who is expert in their own area and contributes hugely on that, but can often only contribute on a narrow front. So a specialist may have every piece of information it's possible to imagine on a particular project, on a process, or a system. And that knowledge is rare and difficult. And therefore, having a specialist involved, particularly at the start of a project, tends to enable an organization to get a really strong research view. Specialists are often seen in research roles, and hence the need for the, uh, the gray lab work in the bottom of the specialist role. That's the person who's looking at all the technical areas and contributing there. However, they are specialists, and by their nature, therefore, not generalists. So they will tend to contribute only in their area of expertise. And sometimes, even if it seems like a very refined field, they will state that they do not know something that many people would think they should know. That's because they are dwelling on the technicalities of the area in which they know. So those are the nine team roles, the positive sides, and the weaknesses allowable and essential indeed to see the shadow side of the role. Are there any questions on that at this stage? OK. Rory, we'll move on. So when you sign up for Balban, either as an individual or a team, and this is a team sample, you will receive at the end of your assessment a team role circle, which takes a look at your team based upon the nine roles we've just discussed and will enable you to assess your perception and the perception of others, the self-perception and the observers. The nine roles are divided into three threes, the social role, the action role, and the thinking roles. And it's been well defined by my colleague Bernard Chanlier here as the social roles, the heart the thinking roles, the head, and the action roles, the hand. So social thinking and action, or heart, head, and hand. Social roles, resource investigator, team worker, and coordinator. The thinking roles, plant, monitor evaluator, and specialist. And the doing or hand roles, shaper, implementer, and complete finisher. As you can see, that particular team is extremely well balanced with, apart from three, three members of the team in completer finisher and two in coordinator, 
every single one of the nine roles has a member of the team in it. So this is what we describe as a team that is potentially balanced. This is a sample team, obviously, and it's part of the reports that you get when you join up onto the Belden system. But it is, it is typical of the output from a team reaction, and therefore something that's very important for people to learn. Next, please. But the point of today is that Belbin is much more than a team building tool. Many of you on the call will be aware of Belbin, be aware of the priorities, the observers, and your own self-perception. And it's very important for that. But what today is about is, is that Belbin isn't just that. Indeed, it only begins with that. So the first purpose is self-awareness and personal effectiveness. It is possible for you to simply use Belbin to find out more about yourself, and you can get perfectly good and adequate information from that. But like a Swiss Army life, it can do so much more. It can do personal development and career planning. You can look for a career in which you are likely to have the skills to succeed. And I'll be honest with you, had I known as much as I do now, I might well have chosen different career paths uh, in my life had I known that my strengths and weaknesses on Belbin would have made me more or less suitable for a particular role. You can develop mutual trust and understanding within a team, and it's very important that you do so. If you know a person's team role, it will help you to work out the way that they, that they react at the moment and the way that they are likely to react to a certain situation. If someone is a shaper, it may mean that they may not listen as loudly and as clearly to someone else, particularly if that person is being thorough and detailed, but can be seen to, to be contrary to their opinions. So if you work with the shaper, you will know about them, and you will know about different meanings to deal with them. Next, team selection and development. It goes without saying that if you're going to pick a team, and you have knowledge of Belbin, then picking a balanced team makes an awful lot of sense because what you're doing is looking at how balanced that team is. It doesn't mean that you simply hire somebody because you're lacking a Belvin team role if they don't have the technical abilities to do the job. That's not the point. They still have to be what we describe as eligible to take the role. But just because they're eligible, just because they have the right qualifications or 20 years experience, are they going to be suitable? Are they going to be able to deliver the role in terms of what you want? And are they going to be able to contribute as a member of the team? Belbin's belief is that 80% of the team's action comes from the technical behavioral eligibility beliefs, but that 20% comes from the suitability of a role or someone within that role to deliver for that team. If that 20% is missing, then at the very least, you have somebody not working to an optimal capacity, and it's quite possible that there may well be conflict within the team. So team selection development, extremely important. Very obviously then, that leads to matching people to the right jobs. We're talking at the moment to a number of recruitment consultants about the ability that before they hire someone, they simply get a Belbin profile for them to make certain that they have the right tools and the right jobs. It follows from that, therefore, that you can build OA and OD in talent management programs using the Belbin methodology, because the areas where there are strengths you can build on, and the areas and the areas where there are weaknesses you can find ways to actually match them up. All of which will deliver a balanced team. Okay. Finally, obviously, when you get those people in place, they're the right people, you've got to keep training them and develop them. And that's one of the key parts of a Belden program. A Belden program, as I like to say, is not just for Christmas, like a pet dog, it's for life. The skills and strengths that you have in the Belden program will stand with you for life. Okay, so that's the Swiss Army life. Very quickly, and I'm going to hand over to Kay soon, I just wanted to run through and summarize where that is. 
There's awareness of behavior, yourself, your interpersonal and team. There's a coaching opportunity. There's a career development. There's how you tackle change management, team performance, getting a balanced team, not just in terms of a balanced team in terms of a current operational team, but short term like a project team. The culture of the team, recruiting and inducting to the team, developing, and also interventions in terms of assigning work and mediating in conflict. So you can see that it's a pretty, pretty broad brush. However, I'm going to be honest with you. When we talk to individuals, and the same is true of urban organizations throughout the world, we often find that people will simply take their profile and do no more than that with it. And so one of the aims for the 2015 program of webinars is to try and develop this theme that if you have your Belbin profile, it is really only the beginning of a journey rather than an end in itself. And it costs remarkably little to take that profile and to do something positive with it. Okay. Right. As an example, you can design a team intervention journey by working with stakeholders, by using the questionnaires online, and by using the feedback for your team workshops and development days. You can do it for a one and one and a half day project, or you can do it for a four to six month long term team coaching project. One of our goals here in Belbin Island is to help coaches and internal consultants deliver using the Belbin methodology in their own businesses. And this ranges from us doing it ourselves, us training you to do it, or a mixture of both of them. A further example, please, Rory. All right, okay. Uh, sorry. You can get professionally trained as a Belgian professional practitioner. That is, I'll mention that again at the end of the, uh, of, of the session. And we are having our next session for those in Ireland uh, in early March where people can be accredited. But I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, at this stage, I'll, I'll remain quiet, which for those of you who know is a very difficult task, and hand you over to a true professional. Kay Joyce has been involved in Belbin for as long as I've known Belbin as a client and now we're really, really honored, I think, to have as one of our first consultants offering Belbin to herself and to her own business. And what of us to do today is to just tell us a little bit, in her own words, about how she's used Belbin, how she's used it with organizations and the pros and the cons. If at any stage again, I take it there are no further questions, so over to you, Kay. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you today. So my name is Kay Joyce, and I have my own business for the last three years after working in industry for about 25 years where I've used Belvin for quite some time. So I'd like to share with you some of the practical applications of Belvin today. So Rory, you can move on to the next slide. So in terms of my own background and experience, so as I said, I'm in um, business myself in terms of finding, moving forward, learning limited for the last three years. Previous to that, I worked in Fort Ireland um, originally, then I moved to Dell uh, Computers, uh, moved to Oracle and Pfizer most recently. So um, overall, in the areas of HR, learning and development, organizational development and up to director level. And often, as we know, Belvin can come in to the organization either through HR, organizational development, or through a function specifically. So I have lots of experience, um, and I've used lots of diagnostics, and I really think Belvin is, is a fantastic tool, and I'm delighted to tell you about my experience today. So I now work with organizations in, in the area of organizational development, learning and development, and HR. I suppose what I've noticed since working on my own is um, many times learning and development and organizational development is not brought in through business strategy. So what I'm trying to do is really trying to um, incorporate and connect learning and development and organizational development into business strategy as I think 
sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect. And it can be executed through leadership development, business coaching, group facilitation, HR activity, and talent management. So this is just a flavor of the types of areas I get involved in. I'm qualified in Belvin since 2006, and I've been using it on different levels in different situations, which I'll go through with you since then. And I have my contact details for you there as well, if you have any questions for me um, today. You can ask me questions throughout the sessions, and just send them through on your text box, um, or Rory can um, unmute you. And also you have my number if you ever want to call me and bounce anything off me. So next slide, Rory, please. So my experience with Belvin has been vast. So um, initially when I was qualified, we used it with a greenfield startup site with newly established teams. Um, and this really worked great because what happened was that everybody that started in the organization went through Belvin. Um, and there were project teams set up after that. And that really worked well in terms of that um, after, after, after applying people to different roles and performing in the team. I've also used Belvin and continue to use Belvin with established teams of which they have maybe a lower level of self-awareness. I use it at individual and team level. Um, so I'm doing a lot of coaching around Belvin at the moment and it's working really well. I have diagnosed findings at organizational level to support project work. So when you have a multiple amount of teams in an organization who have completed Belvin, you can really start diagnosing and slicing and dicing that information. And it can provide you with information for your culture, for organizational development, for HR, and for learning and development as well, and for the organization uh, specifically around functions. Also, I've diagnosed findings at team level. So typically, I would do uh, work with a team, would coach the individuals, and we would also work with a team report as well, which works really well. In terms of the case study that I'm going to specifically go through with you today, the specific business need was compet competitiveness and cost. So this location uh, was really under pressure in terms of lowering its cost base and also there was a lot of competitiveness. So they had to work in a different way. Um, so they decided to reorganize and redesign the organization. This was a huge change in culture to a new way of working for all the different departments in this location. And it also meant in terms of teams and individuals that they would have to work and support each other in a different way. So previously, I would say that there was a lot of silos. People were working in their own department on their own goals. This required a greater level of collaboration. So now there are cross-site goals. There are also resources in varying departments supporting the product life cycle. So they took the product end to end. So from the beginning to the end of the product life cycle, and with a focus on safety, quality, and cost, now people really have to work together to make sure that every step of the product manufacturing along the way is executed. So this requires individuals and teams to be working together to the highest performance. So lots of targets and metrics that weren't there before. This was put in as part of the new organization redesign. Um, and increase the level of accountability and ownership, um, which some people like and some people uh, struggle with. And that's where a lot of the Belvin part came in to increase that level of self-awareness. Also, there was a new part to the business as well, which was business development, which the uh, area of the organization had not focused on before. So we did some work with that team in terms of who uh, fitted best into different roles to make sure that business development was um, worked on on a regular basis. And the team effectiveness is done with the product team. So I'm going to tell you about the product teams on the next slide um, in terms of how they work. And don't uh, worry about asking me any questions that you'd like to um, ask along the way. In terms of product teams then, so the product teams are set up around the product life cycle. So this can be a short-term team or a long-term team. People and resources move across the varying teams. 
So what the organization had started to do, which was different than before, was to move those resources and use them and resource up and down as needed. So each team completed an SPI. Ideally, it would have been great to do the observer assessment also, but time and resources just didn't allow that. So we did the uh, self-perception inventory, which has worked really well. So each team, we brought each team into a room, uh, took them through the relevant methodology, went through each of the reports individually, and we also had a team report for each team as well. And that took approximately a half day. There may have been ongoing work or follow-up after that. So in some cases, I did some coaching. We brought it back into their team meeting. So as John referred to earlier, I think the sustainability of the Belvin is a very important point, that it can be just a report, but I think it's keeping it alive and using it um, at an individual level, team level, and ultimately an organization level. What happened was that it now has provided a common language for teams to use. So we did 10 even more, I think we got up to 15 teams with an average of 15 people per team. So it really worked great where you had people really talking about, uh, you know, I'm a plant or shaper or coordinator. It also brought an awareness to the teams of the gaps that they had and also the, the great potential that they had. So often in different organizations, you might see a trend or theme of a, a larger number of profiles depending on the culture and the industry and the business that the, that the um, organization is working within. Also in terms of sustainability, within the one-to-one -one coaching process, we knitted it in in terms of the team leader sitting down with the person and bringing it into their one-to-one -one ongoing coaching um, sessions. And also in terms of their yearly performance conversation, we have knitted it in for them to talk to them at that level as well, and also connected into the career piece. So many people in the conversations that I've had to connect into John's point earlier is where people have had uh, some revelations in terms of their career preferences around what Belvin has shown them as well. So it really has multiple facets, and I think until you get into it with people and teams, it's really hard to define what that will be. It can have many facets to it. Next slide. So there's always an opportunity for depth with Belvin, I really believe. And as I said, this can be at, at individual level, up to team level, and up to organizational level. So what um, you can do is look at an organization or location and diagnose preferred or least preferred um, roles. So you'll see in the report, if, you got, if you've gone into the website, and maybe, John, you're going to refer to the website at some point today. Uh, there's lovely sample reports on the Belvin Ireland website. In the individual report that the individual gets, you will see there's preferred and least preferred roles in there, which gives people really magnificent information for themselves in terms of their own preferences and the best way for them to work in a team. The OA, as I've said, the observer assessment definitely gives a richer experience. So at the moment, I'm coaching about four people who have done what we would call a 360. So they give their own input, their input of their boss, some peers, and some direct reports. This gives a really, really rich and holistic um, information to people as well. As the self-perception is really our own view of the world, which is really good, but it's really good to have that comparison with other people that have worked with us. And I work a lot around impact and influence as well with people and that whole self-awareness piece. The coaching piece, as I said, I'm using it a lot, um, really brings a richness into the coaching and an opportunity for people to bring the information from Belvin back into their role and up into the team in terms of their effectiveness as well. So really it's multifaceted. I didn't put everything on the slide, but there's so many different angles that come up when I'm coaching people on a regular basis and also for teams and, and organizational trends and themes when you get a multiplicity of teams that have gone through Belvin. Also there's the systemic team coaching piece, John you're probably going to refer to that um, today as well, um, which is a deeper more enriched organization um, offering from Belvin as well. And I think that's all my slides for today.
rolling, is it? Yeah. So I'd be delighted to take any questions that you have. That was just to give you a flavour of how I've used it uh, practically within an organisation connected into um, a business opportunity for, for the location as well. So I'd be delighted to take any questions anybody has. Okay, thanks very much. That was very, very detailed indeed. A couple of things I wanted to, uh, to raise with you, and I'll come back to the systemic team coaching and our website a little bit later on. Um, a, a point you made about the self-perception versus the observers really struck home for me. Um, I've often found it strange that people will do the self-perception, but then do not take the observer forward. And it puzzles me because um, whilst knowledge of yourself is very important, it can potentially be biased. It can be based upon your particular perception of yourself. Um, wonderfully exciting, but if it doesn't match what, what others think of you, it's it, it's quite limited as a tool. So one of the things I've talked to, I've talked, I've thought about internally, is actually almost trying to make it compulsory for people to do observers as well as SPI, leaving the compulsion out of it. Would you agree that, that, that really, to be thorough, you've, um, you've got to actually have both the observer and the SPI? Well, where I see more depth um, in a team and in coaching one-to-one -one is definitely around uh, getting that observer information. Because many times we have blind spots, we have ideas about our own impact and influence that can be right or wrong. So sometimes it validates our own information, and it may not be wrong. Or, and mostly it adds to it. So you get that deeper richness of self-awareness, I think, through getting an um, observer assessment. It's like a 360, so I think invaluable. Um, as the SP is quite limiting. Okay. okay um, uh, Rebecca has a question here, so um, she just wants to double check if, uh, do you run a, a separate 360 in addition to Bellman with the individuals? and? Um, I'll just bring a, I'll unmute you there, uh, yeah. Rebecca, in case you want to add anything to that. So you, you can speak now if you want. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yep. Rebecca. Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Hi Rebecca. how are you? Hi, good, good afternoon. Um, I just want to check with you, um, as I said, I wasn't too sure, did you just run Balvin um, with the individuals, or did you, um, as part of the, the coaching and, and taking this forward to another level, did you run a separate 360 from a, a self-perception um, uh, perspective with the guys? Yeah. So some you organizations, did. yeah, so what I mainly did was the Belvin. Um, however, some organizations have uh, 360 tools as well that you can use in coordination with Belvin. And it really depends on what 360 that the company may have are measuring. But mostly, I think, to get the depth around the self-awareness around roles, I mainly did the Belvin. No, that's absolutely great. Um, no, yeah. that's brilliant. Good, that's good to know. And did you just yeah. run that with the managers and TLs, or I'm assuming you, you didn't do it with all of the the more junior junior staff? No. Did you? So, so mostly for the product teams. In the example I spoke to you about today was SPI, and it was really a resource and time issue more than anything. Uh, and for the TLs and the managers, we um, ran more OA, and definitely for people who. Uh, want that in-depth coaching, it's, it's OA. Um, however, that can be at any level in the organization, and it depends if it's individual development team or organizational. Great, and was that, um, sorry to ask again, but was no that, uh, what was the length of time that you allowed between, between the, the SP and, and the 360? You mean the a separate 360 tool, is that what you're... Yeah. Or the or the Belvin 360 OA. Yeah. So the three so sometimes um, they may there may be a timetable in an organisation which people have to do a 360 at a certain time. And um, I'd normally leave you know about three to six months between the two. Now, do does depend on the learning need of the person or the team. I would say. And also, you'd need to look in terms of how the tools complement each other. But mostly, um, I would keep Belvin separate and connect it up into a team as much as possible as well. 
No, that's perfect. No, totally agree. Totally agree okay? with you. Just once. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I so uh, you know, I have some hard fast um, time frames on it. I suppose it just depends on the situation and, and what the need is that individual or business needs. You know. Perfect. Thanks, a million. No problem. Pleasure. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. Um, another. Another question that stems from that, um, going into having done the profiles of the observers and the team and taking it to the next stage, um, how, how often did you actually move a team to the next stage and um, roughly how long do you think it took for an intervention to really start showing some positive results? So I think at an individual level, the results can be pretty immediate. When mm -hmm. someone gets the report, you have everybody in a team event um, really focusing on their own, probably on their own personally. I mean, people love getting the report and looking at the data for themselves. So I'd say individually it's fairly immediate. At a team level, it's probably going to take two to three months would be my own guess. Mm -hmm. But it depends on where the team are and I suppose the purpose and the journey and the road that they're on. Um, and then bringing that up to organizational level, John, I suppose in the startup example, which is not the one I chose today, but mm. we used it uh, and it t definitely took a year or a year and a half. And I suppose that was purposeful because we were bringing people in, continuing to grow the organization at that time. But what they did is that they specifically set up project teams to work on different parts of the organization and they brought Felvin in. So when we set up a project team, we brought Felvin in and it was really, really powerful. But again, that probably took a bit longer, um, but was probably more in depth um, in the organization and it was covering the individual team and organizational piece, I would say. So yeah. I would say there's a very instant, there's probably a middle ground and the organization, as with everything it takes, a bit longer because you're really yeah. working at an organization development or cultural level. Yeah. Um, what about using Belvin in, in, in recruitment or say ongoing development and talent management? Um, have you any um, comments to add there? Yeah, so I haven't used it uh, and I think when that startup facility um, looked back to see what Belvin could bring, you know, we probably made the conclusion that we should have brought Belvin in at the recruitment stage as well. We, yeah. we used Belvin in the induction. We did a one-week induction for everybody, and we used mm -hmm. Belvin that time. So yeah. before that, um, I definitely would. In terms of talent, we I, I've used it at an individual level. So it could be career, it could be high potential. So I've used it with a group of high potential um, professionals who, within a year and a half, uh, moved into a leadership position. Right. Again, okay. it was was to develop their um, preferences around what their next step would be and increase their self-awareness. That's yeah. where I've been okay. around that area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just going to bring um, Rebecca um, in again. So, uh, sorry, John. Rebecca just has another question. Yeah, sure. so I'm just going to no bring her in again. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Okay, Rebecca, you're, uh, you should be Great, on now. Yeah. Sorry, no, just, just, a, just, I'm just curious. Um, okay, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I'm just no wondering, problem. You know, obviously, obviously, at a high level, and not for, not to get into the detail, of course. But roughly, what do these, these individuals, what do these project teams look at for you, um, in, in conjunction with when, when they, in conjunction with Belvin? What do you mean? What they look? At? So um, you said you set up. You said you said you had set up project teams. Yes, in the startup. What, so what was their, what, yeah, exactly. So what was their, what, what did they specifically look at from a Belgian perspective? They looked at um, individually the contribution that they could bring as a team and they allocated roles accordingly. So for instance, somebody, if we needed somebody to be challenging and dynamic, somebody with somebody with shape or in their profile, we used that. If we needed a creative team, we brought in some resource investigators or plants around that. So we looked at the um, spread of roles we had in the top preferences for people and then as we set up teams in each department, I suppose to get the organization up and running, we put people on specific teams 
uh, connected into the, their preferred roles in Velvet. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Thanks a million. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, a comment really more than anything else. Thanks, Rebecca, for that. Um, Kay, um, one of the things that uh, Belvin is, is, is trying to develop is a uh, program for younger people. Um, they're, they're looking at introducing a program called Get Set this year to Ireland. Um, you talked about careers and, and people making yeah. career choices. How appropriate do you think it is for somebody in an undergraduate or, or postgraduate position or trying to get their wrong on the ladder to have this information at an early stage in their career? Yeah. So recently I've done Belvin with a group of uh, technical people in which it will be their first job. Now, right. I know you're probably talking before that, John. Uh, yeah, but but the, in, the information they've uh, learned from doing this has been amazing. Um, and also when I'm coaching people, even at mid-career, later on in their career, when we sit down and look at what Velvet can bring, it can often, uh, a lot of conversations come out around career. So mm -hmm. for instance, uh, recently I worked with somebody and they had done career anchors. So that they had identified yeah. in a certain job I need this, this and this. For example, autonomy, technical expertise. So what we did is that they brought that information and we brought Belvin along mm -hmm. to see where there was a match or a mismatch. Um, but definitely I think when I look at career guidance in schools, I see, I see a huge gap um, in terms of the tools and the diagnostics. I think this has a nice, wide, broad, almost business perspective as well in terms of just, you know, it's not numbers, you, you know, it's not um, the numerical or the uh, more technical tests, but it gives you that more personal development piece, which I think um, is missing a lot. So I'd love to see use more. And definitely with the people who have just started in their career, it worked really well. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, any further questions from anyone? All right. Um, I'll wrap up then, unless there's anything else that, um, that, that anybody specifically um, um, wanted to say. Um, Talking about two or three things that, I, that, that were raised during that that are important. The first is looking at our website. The second is looking at systemic team coaching. And the third is for those out there who are thinking of um, adding Belden to their toolkit, what do they do next? Uh, we start with the website first. This webinar, along with all the other webinars, and there have been five in the series so far, go straight onto our um, website and you can see them there at any stage. If you have actually registered to join us, then you will receive a link within 24, 48 hours of the presentation which will tell you precisely what you need, yeah, you need to see. But our website, www.belvin.ie, has all the information you want. And unlike other websites, we actually have produced quite a degree of sample work. So you will see a sample report a sample team report, a sample feedback, a job description. There will basically be an awful lot of sample methodology that is completely 100% similar. So if you're thinking of using Melbourne at any level, you'll be able to see precisely what you'll get and help out. Uh, also, of course, you can contact us and, and reach us. You can uh, questions. There are my contact details are at the bottom of that. Kay's also left hers there for, for someone who would wish to get in contact with her about where she's um, going and planning for the future. Uh, we mentioned two other things, the question of systemic team coaching and development in, in, in Melbourne. Systemic team coaching first. It's one of the things that you do if you really want to get in depth to solving a team's issues. Melbourne is the start of that journey. And when you get an issue that is deep, and requires three, six, nine, even 12 months of a, of a resolution, Belbin leads on to what we describe as the systemic intervention that will essentially look at the challenges and problems you face, not only in the existing world, but the potential challenges that innovation and change will give you. Um, 
On the Balbin site, you will find a link to Xenergy.com, which is our sister company, and that in itself will give details on systemic team coaching. And if you register for us, then we will also send you the details of when that company, Xenergy, has systemic team coaching engagements and webinars, and they are generally available. Thirdly, to talk a little about our plans for 2015, for those of you listening for the first time. The first thing about 2015 is that this is about actually taking Belvin message out to people. Um, we had a very successful uh, launch, which Kay and I both attended, in Cork uh, in December. And we're looking to find hosts and monitors to run sessions in Galway, two or three in Dublin, and all in various centers uh, throughout Northern Ireland and the Republic in the course of the next year. If you yourself, in your area or in your business, are interested in working with Balbin, either as a potential coach or to bring it into your organization, then please get in contact with us, and we will, in the course of the period, come out and see you, talk through your objectives, and try and get a solution for you that's going to deliver. End of commercial. Um, that's where we were planning to finish it. Um, could I just thank again Kay Joyce. Kay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Very, very Pleasure. useful. And, and we hope we'll be hearing from you more and more as 2015 goes on. My thanks to you, um, uh, everybody for getting onto the call and listening today. Uh, we look forward to being in contact with you in the next couple of weeks to see if we can help you. Uh, thanks for your attention and time. And uh, with that,